How's everybody doing? Well, it is good to see you. I'm excited about the message. You know, there's some days where you come in and you're just like, man, I can't wait to preach this message. Today is one of those days. Because this message resonated in my heart. This is fresh off the, the burners from God. This last week, God's been stirring this up in my heart. So I wrote most of this uh, just in the last few days. But this year has already started off to a blazing start. We're already almost through February. Can you believe that? I mean, February is almost come and gone. We've already done our series on Fresh Start about getting a clean slate and starting fresh with God. We did our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We, last week, we talked about walking the talk, being the church that's real. Be in the church that's really got the goods, the people that really live the life, that, that love Jesus. We're not perfect, but we know that God has got a plan and, and, and a, a season for us and a purpose for us. But today I want to walk with you and continue on this journey called life because I want to make the most of my life. I want my life when it's said and done to count, and maybe you do too. I hope you do. That you want when your life is over that people actually miss you, that they don't want to say, whoo, we're so glad he's gone. We didn't think he'd ever die. That's not what you want, is it? But I want to make the most of my life. I don't want to just exist. And I want to make the most of, of every moment. And I want to have joy on the journey. Life's too short to not enjoy the journey that God has us on. But have you ever felt like life was just happening? I mean, like, it's just kind of, you're like watching Everything take place all around you. You're living, but you're not necessarily living. At least not living life to the fullest. I mean, you wake up one day and boom, you're 30. Then you're 40. Then you're 50. Then you're 60. Then you're 70. Then you're 80. And you're brushing your teeth and you look in the mirror and you're like, who is this old person looking back at me? Oh my gosh, that's me. Maybe your kids are growing up so fast you wish they'd slow down. Or you think, have I really accomplished what I was put here on this earth to accomplish? Have I accomplished what God put me on planet earth for? Because there's so many questions. And life can be a blur to where you, you blink and it's almost over. You know, the Christian philosopher Dallas Willard said this, the greatest detriment to your soul is to live a hurried life. I'll say that again. The greatest detriment to your soul is to live a hurried life. And we have ruthlessly got to eliminate the hurry in our life. I mean, what are we hurrying for? Kelly and I got to go to a, a retreat this last week called um, Intentional Marriage. Because how many of you know you, marriage doesn't just happen? You've got to be intentional in it. And I learned so much. And one of the things that he talked about, and I want you to look this up. Don't look it up now. Don't Google it now. But when you get home, look up the definition of hurry sickness. It's a real term, hurry sickness. It's a term that was coined in 1985, and it's living life with a sense of excessive time urgency. It's like it's, you're so sick, you're, you're, you, can't, you can't live life fast enough. Life has got to come and come and come and go and go and go and go and go and go and you got to hurry, hurry, hurry. And you live anxious. It's living a life full of deadlines and worrying you're not going to get stuff done, even if there's nothing to get done. There's not enough time to do everything that I've got to do. I, I need more hours in the day. If I had more hours in the day, how many of you could use some more hours in the day? You'd just be more tired. You'd just be more worn out, and you'd probably complain more. I, I, you say things like, if I could clone myself. But have you ever thought that maybe we're so busy hurrying through life, doing things that Jesus said, I didn't ask you to do that. You are wearing yourself out, but I never asked you to do that. Jesus got up early in the morning, every single morning, spent time with the Father, and he says, I only did the things that the Father told me to do. And I think right now many of us are suffering from hurry sickness because we're hurrying through life and we're not living life, we're not enjoying life, and we're not definitely not living it to the full. Let me give you some symptoms of hurry sickness. Rushing through your tasks. Feeling irritable anytime there's a delay. Interrupting or talking over the top of people. Running through your to-do list in your mind over and over again. Treating everything in life like it was a race. Always feeling like you're behind schedule. You're continually multitasking. You're doing this and this and this and this and you're scattered. And you always live life with a sense of urgency. You know there's physical effects that go along with this too. Fatigue. Horrendous headaches. Having a low immune system. So what I'm learning as I get older is to slow down, to stop and smell the roses. 
Because again, you're going to end up at the end of your life and you're going to think, where did all the years go? Where did all the time go? People always used to say that when Kelly and I were first married and we first had Grayson and Grant. They'd say, oh, enjoy them while you're young. You're going to blink and one day they're going to be grown. Well, now they're married. We're expecting our first grandchild and they're 24 and 25 years old. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where did time go? Oh, that my kids could just be those little babies again. Because life can be such a hurry. And we're flying through it instead of enjoying it. Do you know what happens when you fly through life? You miss the God moments. You miss those moments that God preordained for you to enjoy the life that you're living. I believe that God has got people. He has got things that he wants to put in your path. People for you to interact with. People for you to talk to. People you have conversation to do life with. And when we're hurried, we don't see people. I used to get accused of this. This isn't in my notes, but I remember it. One day I was walking through the, I was the youth pastor at our first church and I was walking through the hallway and I saw people that I knew. But how many of you know you can be so laser focused? You see people, but you don't see people. It's just like a a crowd. And I was walking by and somebody goes, well, dang, PD, you just walked by being all stuck up and you didn't even say hi. And it was like I, I acknowledged them, so, but my brain didn't connect enough to say, hey, there's the person that you know. You should have said hi. Because we're hurrying through life instead of living our life. But here's what you need to know. God has moments for you to interact and connect with people, and you're going to miss those moments if you live life hurried. So I want to ask you a question. This is not a trick question. I'm not trying to, to trip anybody up. But how many of you would say that you live a busy life? Let me see your hands. Okay. This is not in your notes, but I want you to write this down. They're going to put it on the screen for you. We're all busy. Busy is a condition of your calendar. Busy is a condition of your calendar, but hurried is a condition of your soul. Hurried is a condition of your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's more than just living life at a certain speed or a certain pace. It's the attitude at which you live that life. Hurried us is a sense of an over-exaggerated sense of self-importance. It's trying to do too much. It's, it's thinking that I'm going to slow down, but I can't slow down because I've got too much to do. But if you slow down, it would probably be a remedy to our pride, our, our sense of self-importance that I've got to do all these things. Because when you live a life that's hurried, it feeds your approval addiction. And it decreases our pa- capacity to see other people and to love other people. Because you can't love on the fly. you got to slow down long enough to engage. And when you hurry, you increase your capacity for temptation. Because you don't catch things. They slip under the wire. They slip under the radar. And before you know it, you're like, how did that happen? Because you were hurried. So I want to slow down. I want to live my life so that I end up at the end of my life having lived it well. And I want to enjoy my life in the journey. I want to live my life to the full, and I want the life that God has given you and the life that God has given me to matter, to mean something. But to do that, you got to recognize what is it that you're living for. Every day that you get up and you put your feet on the ground and you live your life, what is what what is it that you're living your life for? What is your purpose? Why are you here? What makes your life count? And what's going to leave a mark? Well, Paul, the apostle Paul, figured it out. And I don't really usually read this much scripture in one setting, but I want to read it to you today. Philippians chapter 3. And I want to read it to you from the message version because it kind of bites a little bit. It kind of, it kind of hits us right where life is happening. So I want you to listen. Life with Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3. And this is what he says. And that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. In other words, that's about sums it up. Be glad in God. Sounds easy enough. He says, I don't, remind, I don't mind repeating what I've written in earlier, earlier letters. And I hope you don't mind hearing it again because you can hear it again. Better safe than sorry, so here it goes. Steer clear of all those barking dogs, those religious busybodies. They're all bark and they're no bite. They run their mouths night and day. All they're interested in is in appearances. They're knife-happy circumcisers, I call them. If you don't know the whole story about the whole circumcision thing, go read it. I ain't got time to dig into it today. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We can't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it. 
Even though I can list what many would think are impressive credentials, in other words, I can tell you what my life is all about, you know my pedigree. I have a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day. I'm an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the, persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I tear them up and throw them out with the trash, along with everything else that I used to take credit for. In other words, he's saying, I used to think that all this stuff mattered, but it doesn't matter. I tear it up and I throw it out. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. I want to ask you, What is it right now that you think is of utmost importance in your life? But if the world crashed around you, all of a sudden it wouldn't mean anything anymore? That hobby, that this or that, you name it. Whatever it is in your life right now that gets all of your attention, all of your time, that's got you so laser focused on. If all of life came screeching to a halt, if you got a a, a diagnosis that you weren't expecting or or your your relationship took a a southern turn, no matter what it is, if life just began to fall down around you, would those things matter in the end? Because Paul is saying, I used to think that all this stuff mattered. Who I was mattered, what I did, where I came from, how much money I had, how I dressed, all of those things. I used to think that it all mattered. But compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. Dog poop. That's what he said. That's in the Bible, folks. He says, I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. In other words, he said, I didn't want phony religion. I didn't want to just go to church. I want a life that matters. So Paul slowed down and said, listen, I'm going to savor the moment. I'm going to live life for right now. And so Paul began to get focused on the goal. He said, I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally. Experience his resurrection power. Be a partner in his suffering. And go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way I could get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. In other words, if there was any way I could have eternal life, I wanted eternal life. So Paul was focused on the goal and what really mattered. Verse 12, he says, I'm not saying that I've got my junk all together. That I have it made. But I am well on my way. Reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me? Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself as an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal. So he knew what the goal was. Where God is beckoning us us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. In other words, I've got a glimpse of what really matters in life. See, I used to live for all this, and I thought that was important, and that was important, and that's what filled my tank, and that's what made life matter for me. And then all of a sudden, I got a glimpse of Jesus, and it didn't matter anymore. None of that stuff even mattered, and I just throw it away. It's like dog poop to me. But I'm going to focus on what really matters. I'm going to get my priorities in order. He said, so let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it. Yet now that you're on the right track, let's stay on the right track. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those you see running the same course, headed for the same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. But I've warned you against this many times. Sadly, I'm going to have to do it again. All they want is the easy street. They hate Christ's cross. But easy street is a dead-end street. And those who live there make their bellies their gods, belches are their praise, and they can, all they can think of is their appetites. He says, get in a connect group. That's my paraphrase. Get in a connect group. Get in community with people that are running in the same direction as you are. Quit looking at people that are trying to go this way and trying to figure it out, and they've got this newfangled thing. You know what? Jesus gave us everything we need in the Word of God. And if we'll follow his lead, we'll follow his path, it will lead us where we need to go. And find you some other people to do it with, is what Paul said. But there's far more to life for us. 
We're citizens of high heaven. We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform these earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. He'll make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he was putting everything as it should be, under and around him. Paul is saying, you only got one life to live. Let's make it count. Find out what really matters in life. Let's slow down. And he said something here. He didn't say it, but this is what I, I would imagine he would say. Carpe diem. Just shout it out. If you know what carpe diem means, what does it mean? Seize the day. So you're just like me. In 1989, I had no idea what that meant, carpe diem, until I saw Dead Poets Society. And when I saw it, all of a sudden, carpe diem, seize the day, became famous again. It means grab a hold of life. Live life to the fullest. Make the most out of each and every day because you don't know if it's going to be your last. Every day, everybody wants to get the most out of their life. At least I hope we do. No one wants to live a mediocre life. Who wants to get to the end of their life and go, you know what, that was so vanilla. That was so bland, it had zero taste, no salt whatsoever. I mean, it was the most mediocre of mediocre lives. I didn't stand out for nothing. It really was like I didn't even exist. Is that what you want out of your life? I don't want mediocrity. I want to live life to the full. I want to seize the day, not waste my day. And the older I get, the more that I realize how important this is. And how much more real that it becomes. Because time is ticking away. And we had better learn to seize our moments. Oh, you think you're just 20-something. Or you're a teenager. Or you're in your early 30s. And you got the rest of your life. My friends, you will blink. Take it from an old guy. You will blink and you'll wake up one day. And the wrong pillow that you slept on last night could ruin your whole week. (laughs) And things hurt. And you got bruises. And you don't know where they came from. All you were doing is just walking. Seize your day. Well, Pastor, that sounds so good. That sounds great. But how do we do it? How do we seize our day? Well, how do I make my life count? How do I slow down? Well, first, you got to know what really matters in life. you got to know why you're here. Why did God put you on planet Earth? It wasn't just because he needed another cute in the world. He's like, oh, I just made you because, you know, you don't have any real people. You're just cute, and I just needed another cute in the world. You're not, that's not the reason that God made you. None of us live a life of insignificance. Every single one of us here were put on this earth to make a difference and to make a mark. You know, but we feel like we're not living up. Even advertisers capitalize on that. When you turn on commercials or you see ads in magazines and stuff, they always want to make you feel like the life you're living isn't the life that you could have. Let me give you some examples. Taste the rainbow. What is that from? Skittles. I mean, they all taste the exact same. They're good. But taste the rainbow, and you're like, well, life is kind of a little bland. It just, it's so without color, and you know what? I want to taste the rainbow, so I'm going to go get me some Skittles. Here's one that I didn't know, but I looked it up. I was like, famous slogans. Because you're worth it. L'Oreal. L'Oreal makeup. I'm not familiar with makeup. But here's the thing. They're appealing to a generation, to a group of people, to ladies in our world that they're saying, It's because you're worth it. Because you know what? You feel like you're not worth it. You're looking in the mirror. You're looking in what's looking back at you, and you feel like you don't matter. But we're going to tell you you're worth it, and you're going to go buy some L'Oreal. Just do it. Nike. What they're saying is you're not really living life. You're sitting on the sense. You're in the sidelines. You're sitting in the benches, and you're not living life. Go just do it. I'm going to go get me some Nikes, and I'm going to do it. I'm loving it. McDonald's. I ain't never eaten anything from McDonald's and walked out of the saying, I'm loving it. <laughs> Pepto-Bismol, I was loving it. But. but what I'm saying is that they've tapped into a part of our culture where people are saying, you know what? I'm feeling a little down. I'm feeling like life doesn't really matter. You know what? I'm loving it. I'm going to go to McDonald's. What's in your wallet? <laughs> Capital One. So all of a sudden, we're sitting here and we're thinking, I got MasterCard. I got a debit card. I got an American Express. But you know what? They all look a lot happier than me. So maybe I need a Capital One in my wallet, and I'll be somebody. The last one is you're in good hands with Allstate. Well, you know what? I felt a little abused lately by the world, and and my income is not what I need it to be, and this and that. And you know what? I want to be in good hands. I'm switching to Allstate because they go after 
a life that feels mediocre. They go after a subset of our society that feels like here's where I am and here's where I want to be. And if I get the rainbow, if I get, just go out and do it, if I just, because I'm worth it and all these different things. And we buy into the slogan, try, slogans trying to get what we don't have from products that have empty promises. And unfortunately, we get caught up in all of the monotonous details of everyday life and we don't end up seizing the day. The day seizes us. And life becomes a blur and opportunities pass us by and we don't feel fulfilled. We, we set goals, but we don't ever achieve our goals. And another year has flown by. And in 10 months, I'll be standing up here going, Wow, church, welcome to High Point. Can you believe it's already January 2025? Because I've already done that 16 other times since 2008. Because life be- can become a blur. And if you want to just become a spectator to your life, then you just keep coasting, my friend. Or like Paul, you can figure out what really matters in life and engage and live life to the full. I don't want life to seize me. I want to seize life. Because we've all got deadlines. We've all got commitments. We've got problems and priorities and distractions and obstacles that we have to overcome and drama that we have to live through. But I want to live my life with more fulfillment. But sometimes it just doesn't seem within our grasp. And Paul is telling us, but it can be. He lived his life by the philosophy of carpe diem. He never used that term. But if we follow his example, Paul knew how to seize the day, to make the most of his opportunities. And he gives us three ways that we can do it. And if you're taking notes, this is what I want you to write down. If you want to seize your day, the first step is to find your purpose. What's your purpose in life? Why are you here? Because in order for a church or a business or an organization or a family or even an individual to be successful... First, you got to know exactly what your purpose for life is all about. Why did God put you here? Because if you don't figure that out, how are you going to know if you ever achieve it? I fulfilled my purpose. What's your purpose? I don't know, but I'm alive. Living is not your purpose. There's a whole lot more to life than just living. And so when you discover your purpose, then all of a sudden life's going to take on a new meaning. I mean, how many of you believe God's got you here for a reason? He does. Live for that reason. And we as a church want to help you find out what that reason is. I'll give you a good example of somebody that knows what their purpose is. And everybody in here loves them. We love them so much. The IRS. The Internal Revenue Service. But whether you like them or not, they know what their purpose is. They wrote a handbook in 1976. And this is what they said. The purpose of the IRS is... During a state of national emergency resulting from enemy attack. So when the world is bombarding us, the essential functions of the Eternal Revenue Service will be as follows. Assessing, collecting, and recording taxes. While the world's freaking out, we're still going to take your money. You're still going to owe us. We're going to still send you the bill in the mail. Why? Because they know their purpose. And if I were to ask everybody in the room today, what is your purpose? I'd get a thousand different answers. You might think your purpose is to be a good husband or to be a good wife or to be a good student or a good athlete or a good son or a good daughter. Those are all secondary purposes. The question is, is what is your primary purpose for living? What is your primary purpose that God created you for? And if you're old like me, you'll know this song, Conjunction, Junction, What's That Function? Hooking up cars. Anybody else in here beside me know that? All right. So here, thank you, old people. And all you young people that think you're crazy, oh, baby, you ain't seen crazy yet. I can get crazy. But the thing is, is that I remember that, and it reminds me that there is a function that God has us on this planet for. There's a reason for you and I living. Everything in creation has a primary purpose of why they're on planet Earth. And for anything or anyone to be successful, they have to fulfill that purpose. That's the definition of success, fulfilling your purpose. Here's an easy question. Those of you that are taking notes, what's the primary purpose of the ink pen in your hand? To write. It doesn't matter if you've got a $200 solid gold cross pen. If that pen looks pretty, but it runs out of ink, it can't fulfill its purpose and it's useless. It can't write. So when it comes to Friday or whenever you get paid and you've got to endorse the back of your paycheck, Are you going to reach for the $200 pretty gold pen that has no ink? 
Or are you going to reach for that 20-cent big pen that will get the job done and get that money in your account? I'll take the big. Because I want something that's going to fulfill its purpose. So what am I saying? Well, just like a pen has a primary purpose, and it's not to pull the cap off and stick it in your ear and dig around. <laughs> Ew. Every individual was created for a primary purpose. And without purpose, life doesn't have meaning. You can look at a $200 gold pen. You can look like a $200 gold pen when you walk in here. You can have your nails did, your hair did. You can have your clothes all fit. You can be all dressed up to the nines. You can smile and you say, oh, I ain't smiling. I just had Botox on Thursday. And you can have all your bits and pieces put together and look all spruced up in here today. But I got a question. You got any ink? You can look like a $200 gold pen, but have you got any ink, buddy? Because if you don't have ink, if you can't fulfill your purpose, you just look good, but you ain't got a life to live. And Paul knew his reason for living. Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I'll experience the resurrection from the dead. In other words, I want to be close to Christ. I want to experience life with him. I want to know Christ and I want to be like him. Paul recognized what his purpose in living was for. To be like Jesus, and that's our purpose too. So don't hurry through life. Slow down. Enjoy the moment. Smell the roses. The second step in seizing your day, first find your purpose. The second thing, forget your past. Let go of your past. Philippians 3.13, I'll say it again from the NIV. Brothers and sisters, Paul said, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind me and straining towards what's ahead of me. Quit living your life in the rearview mirror. Living in the past keeps you from enjoying your right now and living in the present, and it will rob you of your future. So how do you forget your past? Two steps. Number one, you got to forget the bad. We've all had bad things happen to us, and we all want to forget the bad. I mean, Paul, he had a sketchy past, but man, the brother had issues. He tortured and murdered innocent Christians. He did a lot of pain and caused a lot of damage in the Christian world. So Paul was faced with a choice. He could dwell on his past mistakes and everything he did in life that was wrong and the lives that he ruined and let that ruin his future of ministry and keep him from being effective or he could forget about it and move on with his life. Like our Italian friends say, forget about it. You, know? you need to forget about it. You need to let it go and keep moving forward. Because here's the thing. Many of you right now, you've got a tent pitched and you're camping out right here in all your misery and worry and past mistakes and it's robbing you of your future and it's keeping you from embracing and seizing the day in the moments. I mean, every single one of us in this room, we have a past. All of us have a past. Things that we've, or, or things at least that we've done that we regret and we might be even ashamed of that come back and haunt you, those memories. But if you don't learn to let those go, it's going to rob you of your future. So we've got to forget the past. It's over. It's done. You can't live there anymore. It can't hurt you anymore unless you keep rehashing it and going through it. But you can learn from it, then forget about it, and quit living your life again in the rearview mirror. My old pastor used to say it this way. Admit it, quit it, and forget it. Sometimes that's honestly a lot easier said than done. But what was he saying? He was saying, own it. Admit what you've done. Admit your past. And with God's power, quit it. Quit re rehashing it. Quit repeating the offense. And then by his grace, forget it and let it go and move on. The Bible says that Jesus told us that he would cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. So he's saying, you know, you go that direction. I'm going to throw your sin that way and you ain't got to see it no more. I choose to forget it. Because here's what you need to know. Don't let the first part of your life ruin the second part. Every great team always knows that at halftime they still got the second half of the game to play. My friends, you came in today and you're sitting here and you're at halftime. You still got a lot more game to play and you can turn it around and you can still win. Because when you have Christ and you know your purpose, it's a sure thing. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. It's good news. He said, I choose not to, for, to remember your sins. Why do you keep bringing them up? 
Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Doesn't that sound like a good deal? He said, I choose not to remember your sins. You confessed them. You repented of them. I'm not going to bring them up. So quit bringing them up. Because you're fighting against yourself and you're robbing yourself of their future and you're not living in your present. So why do you keep letting the devil use your past against you? Jesus forgets it, so move on. So you got to forget the bad. But here's what might even be harder. The second thing in forgetting your past, you got to forget the good. Let me explain. Bruce Springsteen, when I was in high school, sang a song called Glory Days about a guy that couldn't quit thinking about his, the good old days. You ever been around somebody and they, they're living in the good old days? The, the, the song sings, time slips away and leaves you with nothing more than boring stories of glory days. People that will zero in and on one period of time in their life where life was better then. So I choose to live in that period of time rather than living in the now. And I'm living in the good times of the past. I mean, it might be that maybe you peaked in high school or you peaked in college. And you're living in the glory days. You remember that day that when we played, you know, Central and or we, we played this team right here. And I threw that touchdown pass or I caught it. And, man, I ran all the way down 50-something yards and made that touchdown. You remember that? Dude, you were 18. You're 60 now. <laughs> Let go of the glory days. Let go of the good days. Because there's a temptation to not want to let go. That doesn't mean we don't remember them, that we're not fond of them, but we don't live there anymore. I mean, bro, you're 50 years old and you're still wearing your high school letterman's jacket. Move on. Let's get past it. Paul knew that a good past didn't guarantee you a meaningful future. So don't forget the memories. Cherish the memories. But don't live in the past. Let it go. Philippians 3, 4 says, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in their flesh, in their past, in their accomplishments, I got more, Paul said. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. I was the dude. I had it all together. I checked all the boxes. If anybody was anybody, I was somebody. But then I met Jesus and I realized I was nobody. And all the stuff that I banked on and all the stuff that I counted on, I realized that didn't mount up to a hill of beans. It was what again? Dog poop. And I'm just, I'm ready. I'm done with it. I'm throwing it away. And then he goes on to say, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for Christ's sake. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I gave it all up for him. I consider them all garbage that I might gain Christ. Paul is saying, I refuse to live in the past. My purpose for living is to be like Jesus. So whatever happened yesterday, good or bad, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to live for Jesus today. I'm not going to live for tomorrow. I'm going to live for today. So let go of your past, the good and the bad. And the third thing, if you want to seize your day, face your presence. Face your present. Live in the present. Live in the now. Philippians 3.13, brothers and sisters, he says, I don't consider myself again to have taken hold of it. I ain't arrived. I ain't the stuff. But one thing I do, I forget what's behind, my past, strain towards what's ahead, the future, and I press on, which means right now I'm living in the moment. I've let go of my past. I'm living to reach the future, but I'm going to press in today and press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Because it's easy to live in the past. It's easy to daydream about your future. But it's a challenge sometimes to face your current situation and your current circumstances. Because you find yourself saying, one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to get free. One of these days, I'm going to overcome my issues. One of these days, I'm going to overcome my temper. One of these days, I'm going to grow in my relationship with Christ. One of these days, I'm going to lose weight. Seize the day. Live in the now. I told you this last week, we went to a, an intentional marriage retreat, and it was incredible. We thought it was going to be like 50 couples or 100 couples there. We got there, it was two other couples. It was three, three couples, me, Kelly, two others, couples, and, and our facilitator. So I was like, whew, it's going to be intense. And he said, you know, sometimes we can live life and not be in the present. And I was like, ooh, I'm preaching on that Sunday. He said, because you're out with your spouse and you're on your phone. You might be here at church today. You're here physically, but mentally and emotionally, you're somewhere else. 
You're thinking about your issues. You're thinking about your marriage. You're thinking about your finances. You're thinking about what lies ahead. You're thinking about what happened right before you got to church. And he looked at us, and he did this. And I was like, is he Catholic? Because I thought it went like this. I didn't. He only got half of it. And he said, my wife and I look at each other. And when we realize that one of us isn't, isn't here, that's our signal to live in the present. Live in the present. So if you see me doing that, I told, looked at Kelly, I said, we're using that baby. Because there's so many times we're here, but we're not here. We're living in yesterday. We're letting something create our headspace from yesterday we're, and crowd it. And we're letting what we're uh, as, aspiring for and living for in the future. And one day I'm going to do this. You got to go to yourself and go like that. So if you see me walking around like that, I'm not going, hey, oh, you know, and I'm not going to shake holy water on you. I'm just saying, live in the now, live in the presence, baby, living right now in the present life that you're living. Because you can't truly love other people if you're not in the present. You'll walk right by them. Your marriage will fall apart. Your relationships will fall apart. John chapter 11. Jesus had a good friend by the name of Lazarus, and he died and. He'd been in the grave already for four days, and in the middle of the, of the desert, how many of you know he, he stank? By the time Jesus got there, he was pretty ripe. And he got there, and, and Lazarus' sister Martha, she comes bolting up. She goes, if only, the, the famous phrase of everybody that lives in the past, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus looked at her, and he said, Martha, your brother will rise again. Future tense. She's like, I know I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I'm following you. I know we have a future. I know that he'll be alive in the future. I know he'll be alive in heaven. He's dead today. He's dead today. Can you do something about today? Because here's the problem. Martha knew that Jesus had power in the past. She'd seen it. She knew that Jesus had power in the future. She was going to see it. She just didn't have the faith, and she wasn't quite sure that he had the power right there for her moment in the present. And here's what Jesus responded to her. John chapter 11, verse 25. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Not I was, not I will be, but I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Light bulbs came on. And Martha answered, yes, Lord, I believe you, that you're the Christ, the Son of God. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today. I believe you for today. And she began to face her present with faith and action. So here's what I'd tell you. Quit living in the past. Quit daydreaming about the future. And live in the now, the present. Because you know what? The past has already happened. You can't change it. Let it go. Don't live there. The future doesn't exist yet, not on our human plane. We're living, if you're living for the future, you're living for a time that doesn't even exist yet. And when you get there, you say, I'm living for tomorrow. Well, when you get there tomorrow, it won't be the future anymore. It'll be today. So you'll never get to tomorrow because tomorrow doesn't exist. That's a time in the future. Your right now is your time. Seize the day. Seize your today. Facing the present means that you have faith in Jesus to do something right now. Not when you're older, not when you have kids, not when you get married, not when you graduate, but he has power for your life right now in your moment. So trust him and believe him for your life today. Your situation, whatever you're facing. We come to church and we say, oh, I know Jesus, this isn't in my nose. Jesus will work it out. A lot of us have faith for Jesus for the future, but we're not there yet. You know where your power comes from? Faith in Jesus today. A lot of times your faith in Jesus today becomes because of what you saw him do in the past. But I don't live there. But I will let what I've gone through and what I've seen give me faith to believe him right now today for what I need. Whatever it is that you need. Choose to live your life day by day. Not in the past, not in the future, but right here and now. 
And so many people miss out living the right life that's right there in front of them because they're caught up in their past and striving for the future. Seize your day. I want to end with a funny story. So you got to be lighthearted. Don't get all serious and don't get your, your undies in a bunch if this offends you. But I, I want to tell you a story. A young soldier and his commanding officer boarded a train to ride together. The only available seats was in a train car with an attractive young woman and her grandmother. So they sat directly across from this attractive young girl and her grandma. As they began to engage in pleasant conversation and they were just chatting, it was obvious to the grandmother and the, and the commanding officer that this young soldier and this beautiful young girl, they had interest. They were sparking. They, they had some interest in one another. They were connecting. All of a sudden, they go through a tunnel and the train car went pitch black. And immediately you heard two sounds. The smack of a kiss and the whack of a slap. And the grandmother thought, oh, well, how fresh. I can't believe that that young soldier kissed my granddaughter, but I'm thankful that she had the courage to slap him back. Well, the commanding officer thought, wow, I don't blame that young man one, one bit for kissing that girl, but she swung at him and missed and slapped me. The young girl thought, I'm glad he had the courage that he leaned forward and kissed me. But I hate that my grandmother slapped him. And as the train exited the tunnel, the, cu the, the young soldier couldn't wipe the smile from his face because he had seized his moment. He kissed the beautiful girl and slapped his commanding officer. <laughs> now, of course, I'm not promoting disrespect. You're like, oh, because I believe in respect. But in all seriousness, in the same way, seize your day. Seize your moment. Fulfill your purpose. God doesn't want you to waste your life. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm 50-something. I'm 60-something. I'm 70-something. I'm 80-something. Have you still got breath in your lungs? If God was done with you, you'd be dead. If you ain't dead, you've still got a purpose. You've still got game to play. So seize your day. Seize your purpose. Seize your moment. He's given us a reason for living, to be like Jesus today. It's not going to happen yesterday. That's dead and gone. It's not going to ha happen tomorrow because tomorrow doesn't exist yet. It happens right now in your presence, so be present. Be present. So what are you waiting for? Seize your day. Discover your purpose. And let's live life to the fullest. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you today that we can live life to the fullest, that we don't have to back down, settle, be mediocre, but we can live our life for you. Lord, I thank you today that you've got moments for us today. Give us eyes to see it and to live in the now. The greatest thing you can do in living in the now, we had 18 people give their lives to Jesus in second service alone had 20 people today because that moment living for Jesus that's your purpose and if you're not living for Jesus right now if you don't know him as your savior you can't fulfill your purpose you can't seize your day not the way you're supposed to not for the way you were created to without Jesus and if you know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you want him to forgive you of all your sins and start a new life in Christ today then I want you to pray this prayer with me Everybody in the room is going to pray it with you. But all it is is saying, I know that I'm a sinner. I need a, a Savior that will forgive me. I repent and I turn from my sin and I'm going to live for God. That's what salvation is all about. And if that's what you want, then I want you to pray this prayer with me and everybody else in the room. So let's do that. Dear Lord, I need you. I'm a sinner. But I need a Savior. And that's you. So I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. And help me to live for you. In Jesus' name.